Damien and I ended up at this company called Kaplan Thousand Research, which is a part of the Kaplan Group of Thousand. So I spent some time being one of their uh, scientific editors, editing papers, and it just come in, and the journal definitely just started. And which is a very interesting job, and that's kind of how I got engaged with the rest of that 1,000 right now in outreach manager for the past two and a half years. So quickly, at the faculty of 1,000, we started out about uh, 15 years ago, and the idea was to set up a um, repository for the literature that was actually recommended by the experts in the field. So the idea was we gathered 1,000 of the most prominent scientists at the time in biology and medicine. And we ask them every month, what are the papers in your particular research area that are of interest to other researchers? Which ones are the papers that you think everyone has to read? So from there, we built that 1,000 prime, which is today the only human curated literature database. Then we started um, that 1,000 research. The idea behind that was to create a platform where people can publish their own research, and particularly the parts of research that are hard to publish elsewhere. Um, and then we figured we needed something in the middle as well. So we had a part where you can discover literature, and we had a part where you can publish literature, and then we needed a part where you can actually write your paper. <coughs> Just a little introduction about the owner of the faculty of 1000, a gentleman called Hugh Beckstrap. And you may have heard of him before. He was the person who also started Biomass Central. So the idea was that he would revolutionize the way science is published. He figured that it was unfair for publishers to charge money for publishing the article and then charge the same people to actually read their own articles. So he figured that subscription-based journals were not the way forward and decided to try out open access publishing, which at the time was quite revolutionary and people said that can't possibly be a business model. Yet he managed to pull it off with Biomed Central and after that he decided science publishing was still growing and certain changes needed to be made. So that's why he started the faculty. As I mentioned, Cap 1000 Prime is the world's only human curated literature database, and it's based on positive recommendations of papers. So while we started out with a thousand of the most prominent scientists, we're now up to 6,000 of these faculty members. So every month, these faculty members pick the best research papers in their field and write about why they think this is such a good article. This is kind of what one of those recommendations look like. Um, so they give it a, any number of stars between one star for a good article and three stars for an exceptional article. They then explain why they think this article is particularly good and also what it can be used for. For instance, some articles are really good for teaching, some are new drug targets, um, some might have like a, a very new interesting hypothesis. So they basically explain why they think this paper is interesting. And you can also read a little bit about these particular faculty members and where they're based and what their own research uh, interests are. So the idea is you can either set up a smart search for articles on particular topics, and every time one of them gets recommended, you'll get a notification from F1000. You can also follow faculty members. So if there's someone in your research area that works as a faculty member and you think um, their research interest could be of interest to you, you can get notifications every time they post a new recommendation. Now, what is F1000 generally being used for? So scientists tend to use it to find good research articles, especially if you're uh, starting out in a new field of interest, which articles should you be reading first? Um, it also, it's also good for identifying collaborators. So if you want to know the researchers that do really good research in your area that you might want to collaborate with, you can check the um, uh, faculty recommendations. Also, research and grant funding agencies uh, use F1000, for instance, for candidate selection. If your article gets picked up by our faculty member, uh, faculty members, it gets a badge that says F1000 Prime recommended. You can put this on your CV along with the recommendation and also which faculty member recommended your paper. And so grant funding agencies can use that to see which candidates are doing particularly well. Also, if you're looking for peer reviewers, these are the experts in your field, so they make really good peer reviewers. Um, they also use it for grant management and monitoring and evaluation, like how many papers come out of their particular fundee. Um, also, communication and PR agencies sometimes use F1000, for instance, to get news story alerts. If a new topic is trending, multiple faculty members will write recommendations. And these are uh, expert summaries. You can also use it to find an expert on a particular field if you want to interview them, for instance. So that's quickly about F1000 Prime. In F1000 Workspace, we basically created to create a space to help people write their articles. Um, so the idea is F1000 is based around projects. You can set up private projects or shared projects. 
So a private project is only visible to you, and for a shared project, you can invite any collaborator anywhere in the world as long as they have an internet connection and an email address. So the idea is you can set up a project for your next manuscript or book chapter, your thesis, grant applications, but basically any sort of project that requires the collection of information. The idea is you can then add references either via your computer, for instance, PDFs or library files, or you can connect to any existing reference manager and pull your references across. Now, if you're collaborating with several people and each of you uses a different reference manager, in the past you had to agree on which reference manager to use. However, with F1000 Workspace, you can each collect these references in whatever format you want and then put them into Workspace to collaborate. You can also add references manually or search by DOI or PubMed ID. Um, an additional matter, uh, way of uh, adding references to your library is using the browser extension. So our browser extension sits on the top of your browser in the shape of a red F, like over here. And with this, you can collect any reference from anywhere online and add them to a project. So the idea is if you're on a search page, for instance, you're on PubMed and you found 20 search results, if you click this red F, it will find all these 20 search results and allow you to imp import them all or select the ones you want, then select a project you want to add them to and add them to your projects. What you can also do with the browser extension is create highlights. So you can highlight any part of the text a little F will pop up, and here you can enter your notes and select a project to add it to. Now, these notes can either be set to private, so only visible to you, or they can be set to shared, in which case people, other people in your project can see them too. The idea behind this is that the notes kind of follow you around wherever you find the paper. So you don't have to make the notes on the PDF like with other uh, annotators. You can make them online on the journal page, on the PubMed page, on the PDF, or wherever else you find the article, as long as you're logged into F1000. So if you make the notes on the PDF and you go to the PubMed page and you find the same article, your notes will be there waiting for you. Now this is what a reference library typically looks like, and you can format this any way you like. So you can customize what you see and what you don't see. Um, it will also save you the PDF if the PDF is published in an open access journal. If, you, if it's not published in an open access journal, you can easily add the PDF through your university library if your library has access to it. It will also save where you found the full text of this article and what search queries you used to find the article. So if you found the article on PubMed using certain keywords, this will take you back to PubMed and tell you which keywords you used to find the article. It will also give you an overview of all the notes that you made. Um, and also, you can add tags to any article. So for instance, if you want to tag all your reviews or all the articles that are written by you and your collaborators, you can do that uh, using tags. Then we have the faculty recommendations. So some of the articles on the previous page had a ref, red F in front of them. That's our software instantly recognizing that these are also in the F1000 Prime database. So if you click on those articles, it will take you to faculty recommendations and tell you which faculty member has recommended this article and what they had to say about it. Now, besides faculty recommendations, we also have article recommendations. So about 24 hours after you put references in your project, the software will go onto PubMed for you and bring you back related articles. So based on what, which, which articles you have put in your library and expressed an interest in, it will bring you back similar articles. Now, the more you interact with the software, the better these suggestions become. So by adding these references to your project, um, the software will learn that this is a good suggestion, whereas if you reject them or dismiss them, it will ask you whether it's not a relevant suggestion or whether it is relevant, but you just don't want to add it to the project. So by interacting with the software, it will learn your preferences for interesting articles. Now, then there's a notes tab as well, and this is basically a collection of all the articles in your project that you have made notes and comments on. And so notes and comments will show you the text that was highlighted, show you the note that was made, and then people, other people in your project can react to this. So this allows you to have a conversation or a discussion online about a particular paper or about a part of a paper. Now, as I mentioned, you can set these notes to either shared or private. So if you have private notes, other people in your project still won't be able to see those notes. If it's set to shared, that allows them also to comment on it. As I mentioned, shared projects, you can invite anyone you'd like. So they don't need to have an F1000 subscription in order to be invited to your project. So what happens if you invite a collaborator that can be outside of your institute, outside of your country, we don't really care where, where in the world they are, you can invite them by email address, add a personal message about why you're inviting them to and what this actually is, and we then give them full access to the software within that particular project. 
And then finally, obviously, we also have a Word plugin that will help you actually put the references you collected into your Word manuscript. Um, so this is what a typical reference manager does. It kind of looks like a, a sim, a, it has some similarity to, for instance, EndNote, where you have an F1000 tab in your Word document. Now, if you're a Mac user, you will have a toolbar instead. Besides putting references into your manuscript and formatting your bibliography with about 7,000 different output styles, so basically you should like the journal you want to submit to, and the output style most likely is already there. If your desired output style isn't there, we can create it for you. But besides this, you can also directly search PubMed or the F1000 Prime database without leaving Word. So the idea behind this is if you're missing a reference, instead of actually having to open your browser, go to a different window, do your search query, you can simply do this from within Word. So you can simply add your search query and it will bring you back the most relevant citations, which you can then directly cite into your paper, which will also save them to your project, or you can save them for later. So the idea is that every Word document you can assign to a project, and then all the changes you make will also be made into a particular project. Now also you can get um, articles based on the text you type. So if you want to double check whether there's anything interesting published since you started writing your article, you can simply put your cursor anywhere in the text and click Smart Citation Suggestions, and our software will go through the paragraph where your cursor is and compare it to text based on PubMed. So obviously this is tailored towards life sciences because it's directly connected into PubMed, but we might expand this to other databases later as well. Um, and finally, you can collect feedback on your manuscript by uploading it to F1000 Workspace and inviting your co-authors to comment on it. And it sort of looks like this. So this is a, just a draft test manuscript. As you can see, it's relatively short. Um, so the idea is that you put your manuscript in Workspace and then invite any co-authors you want feedback from to this project. Now they can then highlight and make comments which appear here in the sideline. And the idea is that these comments are threaded and they're visible to anyone in the project. So people can ask questions and, and your co-authors can read them and answer them. Now when you've collected all this feedback, you can export all these comments back into Word. So rather than having to send everyone a separate Word document and end up with five different versions of your document, you can simply allow anyone to comment on the same document and export all these comments into Word and make your final version. Um, if you want to submit your final version to F1000 Research, you can do that directly from within Word with our Word plugin. Um, we're going to expand that to other publishers as well, but obviously we started out with, a, with our very own just to see how things go. Um, now, if you're not a Word user, but instead you're a Google Docs user, what used to happen is if you want to add your references into Google Docs, you would still have to export your document to Word and use a reference manager to put your references in or do everything manually. So F1000 has created the F1000 plugin for Google Docs. So, so far we're the only reference manager that actually has a functional uh, referencing system in Google Docs. So the idea is from here you can either select references from your libraries or you can select references from PubMed or F1000 Prime to put directly into your Google Docs document. Now if you're a LaTeX user, we are also working together with Overleaf to create a plugin for LaTeX users. Um, and this is something that's coming up soon. So um, at the end of the year, we're releasing our mobile app. So the idea is you can collect references and uh, highlight and make tags and papers directly from either your mobile phone or your tablet. So these are a few previews of what this is going to look like. Um, so you can search your, uh, your database, so your uh, uh, reference projects. Um, you can find faculty recommendations. You can highlight and comment on papers. Um, and you can create and add tags to any uh, reference you've collected. Now, if you would like to try this out, everyone at the Max Planck Institute has free access to uh, the tools I've just described. So if you want to try this out, you can go to f1000.com slash work, create your account, and mention that you're part of the Max Planck Institute. We then ask you to, within 60 days to log in once from the IP range of the Max Planck Institutes um, so that we can verify you indeed work there. And that should give you access for the rest of your uh, PhD or postdoc uh, contract. Now, if you were to leave the Max Planck Institute, we make sure you don't lose access to any of the projects you've created. So basically, they will remain available to you. At some stage, you will lose the ability to create new projects, um, although you can extend your uh, personal uh, subscription or uh, maybe your new institute will have a subscription as well. Um, you can also export all your references and notes and comments to a format that you can then import into other reference managers. All right, now the last part of the presentation is about F1000 Research. So F1000 Research is slightly different because it's completely open access and so it's not subscription-based. Um, 
And the idea behind F1000 Research is to create a platform um, where we can publish all sorts of research, big and small, across life sciences and medicine. So anything that is related to biology or medicine will publish. And the idea is we publish all sorts of different articles. Um, we publish articles almost immediately after an in-house editorial check. We then have a completely transparent refereeing system. We don't have an editorial bias, and by that I mean we don't have editors judging the papers on how they perceive uh, the, they will impact the field. So our editors are asked to check the science, but not the importance of the science, because we want to leave that up to the research community. Um, we then ask that all source data will be included. So that means you can't just send us the figures. We also want the underlying data set so that people can have a look at the raw data and so that this raw data could be reused by other scientists. And finally, our articles are indexed in PubMed as soon as they pass peer review. Now, why did we start F1000 Research? We started F1000 Research because many people are complaining about the same problems in traditional science publishing. For instance, there's an extensive delay in publication. So this means anything you find in databases such as PubMed is not exactly new because it takes at least six months, up to a year, or maybe even several years to get these articles published. So it means while scientists are working on the cutting edge of things, the literature they use isn't exactly new. These papers are not new. Um, there's also a lot of repeat refereeing for different journals. So that means if your paper gets rejected somewhere and you send it somewhere else, a whole new group of people has to spend time looking at the same data, the same article. There's also on the author side a lot of time and money wasted because some people have to completely rewrite their manuscript because journals have different standards and journals have uh, uh, different, for instance, uh, allowances for figure numbers or reference numbers or how long the paper can be. So this means authors often have to completely rewrite their manuscripts. Also, anonymous pre-publication peer review would conceal both a referee but also an editorial bias. You don't know who the editors and who the referees are, and you don't know if they may be competitors of yours. There's also a lack of reproducibility in much of published science. Some people even say that up to 60% of published science can never be replicated. And that is not to say that 60% of this scientific results are not true, or they're based on false data. It may simply mean that the materials and methods were not accurately enough reported for people to repeat these experiments. Also, there's a publication bias, and that means a lot of good science is never published because it's either deemed not important enough, or maybe it's a preliminary study or a small study, or it may just be a negative or null result. Now, we at F1000 believe that these results are indeed important. It's important to know whether a different lab can repeat your results. Um, so we think it's very important to include these articles as well. Um, so finally, our publication process, which is slightly different from the traditional process. So the idea is that people submit their data and their paper, and then usually within two or three working days, our editors will be in touch and make sure uh, they'll let you know whether or not we can accept this paper for publication. If we can't accept it for publication, they will explain what exactly is missing or why we can't accept it. If we do accept it, it is then published within seven working days. And that is both the paper and the data. So the data is an integral part of the paper and gets its own DOI, so it's separately citable. Um, we then invite the referees. So at this point, the paper is published, it's citable, but it is not peer reviewed just yet. However, at the same time we publish it, we also invite the referees. Now, the referees can be suggested by the authors, and we have a team checking those suggestions to make sure you don't invite your friends, your lab mates, or the people you've been collaborating with for the past 10 years. Um, these referees are not anonymous. So both their names, their affiliations, but also the entire referee report will be published alongside your article for everyone to see. This has certain benefits, as in you as an author can also leave comments, and you can talk directly to the referees. So that means if you think you're being treated unfairly or a referee has misunderstood something about your paper, you can write an author response and explain or comment on that. Then if the referees decide your article needs revision and, or you need to make some other changes, you can do that by creating a second version or even a third version, which is then published on top of the old version and sent out back to peer review. Now peer reviewers can give it any uh, of three uh, different levels of approval. So approved, which basically means this article is good. Maybe there's some minor comments they'd like you to change, but in principle, this article is good enough. Then there's approved with reservation, or the question mark, which means this article in principle is good, but it has some major things that need to be addressed before it can be approved. And then finally, there's not approved for the articles that really lack something, um, the articles that don't live up to the scientific uh, rules for good publications. 
Now, this is what a typical referee report could look like. So you can see the referee's names if a name is visible. You can also see where they're based. Um, you can instantly see whether or not they approved the article. You can then decide to read the entire referee report. Now, if an author has something to say back to the referee, or maybe they just want to let the audience know they're going to work on these suggestions, but it might take a few months to do the experiments, they can leave an author response over here. Now, readers as of the science community can also leave comments. These comments cannot be anonymous, which means you have to leave a name uh, so that people can see who you are. Um, these comments do not count towards whether the article is approved or not, um, but they can start a scientific debate and discussion. Um, also, we show how many times an art, uh, uh, a referee report has been viewed. And referee reports are fully citable, which means they have their own DOI. So if you're writing a review and you see a very interesting article, but also very interesting comments from the referee, you can actually cite those comments of the referee in your, uh, in your review. Now, as I mentioned, there's three different levels of approval. And we've agreed with PubMed that as soon as an article reaches either the two approved or at least one approved and two approved with reservations, um, it is suitable to go into PubMed. So these are the minimal requirements uh, for indexing in PubMed. Articles that haven't yet reached this threshold can be revised and re-reviewed. There's no time limit on that. So if it takes you half a year to do the experiments or a year to do the experiments, that's absolutely fine. Now this leads to the fact that articles are often um, improved beyond what is absolutely necessary. So for example, this article got an approved with reservations from refer uh, referee number one. So he had some serious concerns that the authors needed to address. Now, the author, authors were pretty keen to get their article out in PubMed as soon as possible, so rather than waiting for the other referees to look at it, they instantly started revising the manuscript, sending a new version, making reviewer uh, number one perfectly happy. Reviewer number two then looked at it and was like, yep, great, this is a good article, I approve it instantly. Um, so at this stage, the article had, had its two approves and was ready to go out to PubMed. Referee number three, however, still had some questions. So the authors had no need to actually address these questions because their article would go to PubMed either way. However, because this is all public and because everyone can read the questions, they also wanted to please referee number three and decided to make a version three, which was then obviously also sent out to PubMed, um, just to make sure that all the remaining questions had been addressed. Now, there are several benefits of using this model. For instance, publication speed is increased by a lot. So we publish articles within seven working days and depending on how quick authors and referees are responding uh, to the referee process, the article can be out in PubMed really fast, a lot faster than the six months to one year that the regular traditional review process takes. Um, there's also the inclusion of all the supporting data, and this allows people um, to reuse the data by citing the data set and the paper. Also, this allows referees to check the data more thoroughly. Um, and also, the open invited review after publication means there's no delays in sharing findings. However, an article before it's peer-reviewed will have the status awaiting peer-review. And if one wants to cite this article, this will be part of the citation, just to make sure that everyone who sees it knows that this article hasn't passed peer-review yet. Um, also, the referees tend to focus shift because their review is public. They tend to not be overly negative, but they're also really careful not to miss things. Also, the way they tend to phrase their criticism is more constructive because nobody wants to be seen as the jerk who's really, really mean. Um, so the idea is that referees are still openly critical. However, they also point out how they would address the issue if this were their paper. Um, so therefore, also referees get formal credits. So their reviews can be cited and they're not anonymous, which means that people can actually take credit for the reviews that they write. Then there's versioning. So if you want to make changes at any point in time, you can. Even if your paper is already in PubMed, if you find a way to improve it later, you can do that. Now, every time there's a new version of the article, there's also a, slight, uh, a short update box. And this is to let the readers know what has changed from the previous versions. Um, also, this publishing is now more in line with the ongoing process of research. So this means, for instance, if you publish a software tool and you want to create a new release, it's still the same software tool, but you might want to let your audience know that there's a new version available. It minimizes research waste. Um, so you don't have to duplicate uh, fund the same research because this research can now all be published. Even if it had a null result, people can let other uh, researchers know about it. So if you've created that mouse model that had absolutely no phenotype, there might be 10 other labs in the world who are trying to do the exact same thing as you, getting the exact same results as you. 
However, nobody knows about this because nobody can publish it because it's a null result. Um, so basically, researchers can benefit from all the research outputs. And this, in the end, will make uh, science not only more transparent and uh, faster in publication, it will also reduce the cost. Now, another thing that we're doing with F1000 research, rather than having an F1000 research biology and an F1000 research medicine or an F1000 research infectious biology, um, we have virtual collection journals. So we have both gateways, which are portals for either institutes or organizations or even conferences that link to featured content uh, and papers. So examples of this are Doctors Without Borders have their own gateway or the ISCB. We also have channels, which are virtual collections on a particular topic. For instance, we have an Ebola virus collection or a collection where people can submit their antibody validations for free. Now, examples of such gateways and collections kind of look like this. So an organization can decide what they want in their gateway. So we also publish posters and slides. These are not peer reviewed, but they do get a DOI. So they don't go into PubMed, but you can share them on a digital platform. Um, so can this, they can select videos, slideshows, and posters to feature on their page. Um, they can also have several research channels on particular topics. And then finally, an, a, a new thing that we're trying to do is um, get funders involved in publishing. So research funders are involved every step of the way except the last part. So they fund the research, they fund the researchers, they often fund the labs, but when it comes to publishing, um, they fund it, but they often don't get to read the papers. So, for instance, they would still need a subscription to Nature or Elsevier journals in order to read the publications that come out of their research funding. So rather than having the funders on the sideline, we think it's a good idea to get funders involved. And also this allows people to share data that maybe the traditional journals don't want to publish. So the first of the research funders to try this is the Wellcome Trust. So they've created Wellcome Open Research. And this is a publishing platform that is owned by the Wellcome Trust. We, as F1000, have turned from publisher into service provider in this case. So we provide the infrastructure for them to run this publication platform, but it is their platform. So the idea is that everyone funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, can publish the results that they think are worth sharing. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, is owned by Wellcome. We provide as a service provider, and this changes the role of publishers from gatekeepers in deciding which articles and which data is good to publish and what not, into facilitators. Um, which we think is important because in the, in the end, publishers are not the ones who have to decide which science outputs are worth publishing and which ones not. That is way more up to the science community to decide what, what is important. Um, so the idea is to try this with several different funders. So at the moment, we are also talking to the people of the, of the Max Planck Institute. Um, so the big question now also is, every funder wants to know, would researchers uh, that they fund support such a platform? So the idea is we're having this conversation with funders, including the Max Planck, and we're wondering, is there scope for a Max Planck platform? Now, obviously, you as scientists would know whether this could even be of interest to you or whether this is completely irrelevant. Um, so if you have anything to say about this topic, I would love to hear from you. If you think there would be support for such a platform, I would love to hear from you. Um, so this is basically what I have to tell you about F1000 research and F1000. If you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you. Thank you.